We are starting today, we're starting a series entitled What's in a Name? Um, I found this logo, I just thought that was so cool. Um, I want to introduce you to God during this series. Um, Everybody knows who God is. I mean, the people of the world know who he is. Even those who don't maybe believe in him use his name in the wrong way. Uh, so they know, he, they know he's around and they know who he is or they've heard of him. Um, they not, may not believe in his existence. But I think sometimes we, we sort of take him for granted. His name means so much and he describe who he is. And I want us as as people who are seeking God or as people who know God already, to have a renewed sense of awe for who he is. Each of these names of God describe who he is. They describe something about his character or his ability to do something amazing. We come here to worship God, but sometimes we don't maybe not know who he is exactly. And we want to know him more. And so that's my prayer for this series, is that we are able to know him better, more deeply, and and have that sense of awe of who he is. So let's pray. Father, I just want to say thank you for introducing yourself to us. I'm thankful, Father, that you came and created us, that you made us in your image, that even when we messed up, you came to our rescue. So, Lord, I'm thankful for the way you've introduced yourself throughout Scripture. And I pray, Father, that as we look at your names over these next several weeks, that that we will, again, renew our appreciation for who you are. That we would have a sense of awe of who you are. And that our worship and our service would be different because our hearts are changed. Thank you again for making yourself known to us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. A lot of times as parents, um, we like to think that we are present and available for our kids. And I would like to be able to tell you that every time my kids came in to talk to me when they were younger, that I always turned down the TV or that I always turned down the song that I was listening to, or that I was always available to them when they called. I told them that I would be. I told them when when they were old enough to understand that dad works and that sort of thing, I told them, I sat them down, I said, now, this is going to be different for you, um, but I want you to know you can call me any time that you want, and and I I will answer the phone. Um, well, at the time, we had a secretary at the church, and, and she put calls through. And I, have to, I, I wish I could tell you that every time she said, oh, Alicia's on the phone, wants to talk to you, that I was like, oh, good. Because if I was in the middle of a thought or something like that, then, then I, oftentimes I would say, and then, I, I mean, I would, the secretary never heard me say that. But we would like to think that we're always available to our kids, and we're present that we always put away our devices or that we always give them our undivided attention and that they know that they can come to us at any time. But we live in a busy world. It's hard to do that sometimes. But good parents and grandparents at least try to be available to their kids. In the book of Exodus, chapter 3, God introduces himself. Now, we've already seen God in the book of um, Genesis. I mean, God introduces himself to Adam and Eve. Obviously, they know who he is and and that sort of thing. And God has introduced himself to various um, other people throughout the book of Genesis. But we only know what his name is because of this particular chapter in, in the book of Exodus. When God tells his name. We already know that when, he, when Moses sees the bush that's burning, but it isn't consumed by the fire, um, he goes to investigate. Um, in, chapter, in chapter 3, verse 2, it says, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of the fire within the bush, and Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Joseph, or Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight and why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from 
within the bush said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. He said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. So we know through this that God is holy. And that there's a certain amount of respect that needs to be paid to him from mankind. Moses was a good and decent man, but still he had to take off his shoes, his sandals, so that, so that he could approach God. We also know he introduces himself as, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So, so the stories about God had made their way throughout the generations, throughout the centuries, between um, when the people of Israel went to Egypt uh, to escape the famine down in Israel to the point where now Moses is, is there. Hundreds of years have passed. But obviously the stories remained because Moses knew exactly what he needed to do was to fall down on his face before God. So, so who God was, or at least something about him, was evident to them. Now, as God explains it to Moses, hey, I want you to go and lead my people out. And Moses is making all kinds of excuses about this, not wanting to do it. He's afraid. He's nervous. Uh, he talks about not being able to speak very well in front of people and all this kind of thing. And but one of the questions that he asks God is, well, who am I to tell them is sending me? Because if I go to them and just say it's me, they're probably not going to listen to me. So what, 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 what can you give me here? And in verse 14, we read this. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to tell or say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God introduces himself by name. Yahweh. Yahweh is the Hebrew word for I am. Jehovah is another name that is a derivative from Yahweh. So Yahweh, Jehovah, I am. You know, uh, if you notice, that's in the present tense. It means God is. He's eternal. He's constant. He always was, and he always will be. I am has sent me. What that tells us tells us two things. We read in this story, I see two things that come out. First, God is present and accessible. This God, this creator of the universe, Yahweh, the I am, the one who's always existed, who has always been, and who always will be, has made himself present to mankind, to humanity. And now we know who he is. He's introduced us, he's introduced us to him through Moses. And we know God. And now we know also we'll see that he is accessible, that, that we can go to him. That he's not this God who just sort of sits out in the middle of nowhere and, and we just have to pretend he's out there. No, no, he wants us to have this relationship with him. He wants us to come to him. The thing that we see in the word Yahweh, in the name of Yahweh, is the presence of God. Again, he is constant. He is eternal. He is always there. Always mindful. Always watching. Always listening. Always aware of the things that we go through. He is constant. And the people of Israel saw him, or saw a form of him. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 21... Um, after they've come out of Egypt, it says, By day the presence of the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. And so they saw the presence of God. They couldn't see his face. They couldn't make out a form. All we know is that he was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And we see very early on in this, in chapter 14, that, that this pillar sets, itself, sets himself between the people of Israel and the Egyptian army as the people of Israel are crossing the Red Sea. So this pillar was with them always. And in Exodus chapter 33, verse 14, Moses is like, if you're not with, if you're not with us, then, then we've, got, we've got nothing. And God says, my presence will go with you. 
<laughs> we think that's fine. That's Moses. But what we also know throughout Scripture is that God is present with us. If you would, turn to one, Psalm 139. We're going to look at verses 1 to 10. Psalm 139, verses 1 to 10. This is David in his psalm. And this is such a beautiful, beautiful psalm about the presence of God. You know, when we think about the presence of God, it can feel intimidating because God knows everything about us, and that can be uh, uh, scary. (laughs) But here's the thing. What's beautiful about it is that even though God knows all the ugly, he still makes himself available to us. That's that's amazing grace. Psalm 139, starting with verse 1. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and you know when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. As David thinks about the presence of God, he can't begin to fathom it. He, he's overwhelmed by it. He doesn't understand why God would love him and want to be with him in his mess. Verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. He goes on to talk about how he's even there with him in the darkness. The darkness can't even hide him. God's presence is aware of us. It's a beautiful thing to think that in the, in the midst of creation, here we are, these tiny human beings, six billion of us or whatever the number is now, and God is aware of every single one of us. He is present. Yahweh is not anonymous. We know his name and he knows us. And by making himself known to humanity, Yahweh has made himself accessible to us as well. And that accessibility comes because of Jesus. It's because Jesus came into the world that now we have access to Yahweh. Now we have access to the I Am. He's not some presence who's with just other people, other better people, he is with all of us because of what Jesus did. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, a scripture we see a lot during the time of Christmas, um, it says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. And in Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 to 23, we see the, the fulfillment of that. The, the angel talking to Joseph in a dream says all this took place, and Matthew just kind of commenting on that. He says all this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we'll call him Emmanuel, which means what? Say it. God with us. God with us. His presence. Jesus makes this possible for us to have access to Yahweh, to this unapproachable God. Now we have access because of Jesus. In Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We come into the the presence of a holy God, In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, Paul says, For through Jesus, Jews and Gentiles, we're the Gentiles, have access to the Father by one Spirit. This holy, righteous, perfect God has allowed us access to Him 
through Jesus and through the power of his Holy Spirit. Yahweh's Yahweh's presence and our access to him are personal because of the Holy Spirit. I, I've, I've talked about this before, but it is an amazing thing when you think that God, when he created the world, when he created Adam and Eve, he was with them. It says that he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And so there was a, there was a relationship that God had with man, with humanity. But then sin came into the world and and Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, and God separated himself from them because of, because of the sin. But he never lost contact with them. He was constantly talking to individuals about who he was, and, and he would come to their rescue and do things for them, the but gods that we talked about over the last few months. God stepped into those moments and did something amazing for humanity. And then God, through Moses, builds a tabernacle, a tent. And says, hey, this is where my presence is going to be. This is where I'm going to live. And so now God was living in a tent in the neighborhood of the people. The people could see it, and they would go there for like offerings and things like that. But they weren't allowed into the most holy place. Only priests were allowed to do that, and only once a year. And so he was, he was present, but he wasn't really accessible. And then, and then through Solomon, he built a permanent structure uh, right in the middle of Jerusalem, in the neighborhood, right there, so people could come. But still, only the high priests were allowed into the most holy place. So God was present, but he wasn't completely accessible to people. But then Jesus comes. Jesus, God in the flesh, walking among mankind again, walking among humanity, teaching, healing, loving, having compassion on people. And now there is intimacy again. People could touch him. People could see him and hear him. This, this God-man talking to people and having relationship with them. Then the Holy Spirit comes, and where does he live? In us. Completely personal. More personal than he's ever been, so that we could have access to him 24-7. We don't have to wait for a special day. We don't have to wait for an invitation. We've already been invited. Those of us who are Christians have already accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. And that's God being personal with his people. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, Paul asks the rhetorical question, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? And where is he? Who is what? In you. Whom you have received from God. So this access to Yahweh is tremendous privilege. I, I cannot overstate that. I cannot. I, I, I just can't. I, this is tremendous. Think of whatever other word. Spectacular. Stupendous. Stupendously marvelous. I, I, you know, what, whatever. Fantabulous. I, I've heard that word before. I mean, just whatever word you can come up with, this is a tremendous privilege for us to have access to Yahweh. And so he invites us to come in. The writer of Hebrews says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we will receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We are invited in because of Jesus, because of the Holy Spirit. We have access to this living, holy God. That's good news for us. In our darkest moments, in our celebrations and our victories, God is with us and he loves us. There's a word of caution, though. So I thought through this. Sometimes familiarity breeds arrogance and disrespect. I don't know if you've noticed that in your life. That became painfully obvious to me in a moment this week when I was preparing this message. Sometimes I take God for granted. 
this Yahweh. I forget my place. I forget who I am in him. And I forget sometimes the awe that I need to have. So I'm just going to say this to you as I've said it to myself and as the Holy Spirit proclaimed it to me. Don't let your familiarity breed arrogance and disrespect for God, but instead let it maintain a sense of awe of who he is. There's a passage in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 7 that the Spirit led me to. It says, of Jerusalem I thought, surely you will fear me. But they were still eager to act corruptly in all that they did. Jerusalem, of all the people who, of all the groups of people that should have known God, the Israelites, they disrespected God and acted arrogantly because I think they'd become too familiar with him and had lost their sense of awe of who he is. And we have to be sure that we avoid that. Maintaining that sense of awe of God, this constant presence that allows us access to him is an amazing thing. Yahweh, I am. Constant, eternal, present, yet accessible. In order for us, I think, to really appreciate who God is on a daily basis, we have to draw near to him. I think sometimes people think that God is, they, and I hear them say, God is distant. Well, the only reason that God seems distant is because of us. We hold God at arm's length. We hold God back because we're not willing to trust him. Maybe we're not willing to let him have everything that he needs. And so we're the ones who hold him back. We're the ones who keep him at a distance. But over and over again in Scripture, we are encouraged to draw near to God. James says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, uh, the writer says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance of faith. Confidence, again. As in Hebrews chapter 4, here again in Hebrews chapter 10, we draw near to God with confidence because of the faith that we have in him. I've had conversations with people, and I've thought this sometimes myself, that I need to get my act together before. I can draw near to God. No, you do not. That's where the power of the Holy Spirit comes in. He's the one who gives us the ability to change. He's the one who transforms us. He's the one who makes us different. And so it's through his power that we we are transformed, that we are changed. You don't have to do this. You can't do this on your own. God gives us access despite who we are. But there is this desire for us to change, to become more like him. Jesus invites us to come. In in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Yeah, 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 well, Jesus doesn't know me. Well, yeah, he does. He actually does. And I love this verse from John 6, 37. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being present and for being accessible. Thank you for seeing us, and despite the fact that we have flaws and and we fail, you still love us and you still desire relationship with us. God, I pray for those right now who are holding you at arm's length. I pray, Father, that they would allow you access to their lives. I pray, Father, that you would help them to understand the goodness of who you are, that you've come for them to encourage them and to help them and to give them peace in their chaotic moments. 
Thank you so much for letting us come to you. I pray for all of us, God, even those of us who have accepted you as our Lord and Savior, I pray that all of us would allow you to have access to us. That you would do an amazing work through the power of your Holy Spirit to transform us and make us different. As we conform to the image of your Son, Lord, I pray that in this moment of invitation that we will consider how we should respond to you and that you will be pleased with that response. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.